Welcome to the Fish Nerds. It's a celebration of fish, fishing, and eating fish. That's always interesting, usually funny, and mostly true. I'm Candice Marie from YoungYetWise.com, and here are the nerds. I'm Clay uh, from the Fish Nerds podcast, your host. And uh, and who are you? <laughs> uh, I am Phil Belcher. I uh, do a little bit of fishing. That's pretty much it. And I run Anglers Informer. Uh, I also have a Facebook page, Phil Belcher Outdoors, uh, on Facebook as well. But I happen to just do a little bit of fishing. Yeah. Now, Phil, you... You're, you're understating yourself. You do a lot of bit of fishing, and you manage to do that fishing with having like 19 children. Uh, and I'm always amazed at how you fit your fishing in around your family. Like you do your family stuff all day, and then you fish kind of all night, and you sleep at work? When, when you yeah, sleep? pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> um, thankfully, I, I don't require a lot of sleep. Um, and that may change as I'm getting older. I'm, I'm in my early 30s now, and it's starting to catch up with me a little bit. Um, yeah, I, I work a regular you know, nine to five job and then go home after five o'clock and do my family stuff. Um, and then kids go to bed, wife goes to bed at usually like nine o'clock and, and I'm out the door usually fishing, uh, till one, two in the morning, go home, sleep for a bit and do the same thing the next day. Uh, it's amazing. So yeah, understated as far as that, by the way, it's your birthday today. It is not. It is due. It's totally your birthday. No. Is September. it? September. No. Oh. It came up on <laughs> Skype. Today's Phil's birthday. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. All right. Hey, Phil, um, happy new year. This, this is airing on uh, the 2nd of January, so it'll be 2017 when people hear this. Uh, and I want to hear, what is the best fish you caught in 2016? What's the fish you're most excited about? Oh, that's a really good question. It is. Well, I'm going to tell you mine uh, while you think of it, because I'm excited about it. Okay, sure. So, so I this year, as you know, I became a fishing guide. And Congratulations. He, well, yeah, it's been a very weird transition. Some some people who have been close friends of mine have now kind of been backing away. People who I used to fish with now are less interested in talking to me, which is weird. And um, other guides, you know. And I didn't expect that. But um, but I've been taking fishing more seriously because I want to make money at it. And as you, when you make money at things, you usually take things a little more seriously. And this year, I caught my personal best brook trout through the ice. Actually, through anything. That's my best brook trout. It was about 19 inches long uh, in ice that was uh, an inch and a half thick and water that was a foot deep. And it was wow. this monster. You j- and it's such a cool process. You take these little hot pink is the color that they like. Hot pink mm-hmm. jig with a hot pink piece of rubber worm or whatever on it. And you're looking down your little fishing hole and you're jigging. And the fish come in. Now, you're in a foot deep of water, so you're standing literally inches from the top of the fish's head, jigging. And they're oh. underneath your feet. And you have to, like, I play keep away with them. I won't let them have the jig. And if you do it long enough and don't let them have it, two or three big uh, big brook trout will come in and try swiping your bait. And they just get really insane in there. And then the big ones just push the rest out of the way and grab it like a monster. And then you, you, you fight them in. So I've seen the video. It's a beautiful fish. It's an amazing fish. And uh, that's going to get me a, a trophy patch for my, for my vest so I can pretend I'm good at stuff. <laughs> it's funny. With those fish, those are broodstock um, fish. Those are like two and a half, three-year-old fish from the hatchery. Those are the parents of the stocked fish you see everywhere. And mm-hmm. the whole notion of like a trophy fish to me is really funny because it's really luck. It's not like I worked really hard today for that trophy fish. I was jigging in a hole and a trophy fish bit my bait. It could have been any fish. Anyone could have done it. But yeah. I'm still kind of proud. <laughs> <laughs> you should be. Yeah. yeah, a lot of it's luck, and, and some of it's you know being it's still luck, but right place, right right time. That's luck. Using the right <laughs> using the, using using the right gear, you know, on that day. Oh, I will tell yeah. you though, the pink. Uh, everyone else who was jigging around me that day was using like Swedish pimples and traditional stuff and putting traps out. Nobody else was catching fish except for people using pink. So me and my friend Vinny, that was it. Ah, so, there you go. There's the scale, pink. That's the one thing you <laughs> know. So you're my- your best fish. My, I wouldn't. It wasn't my best fish, but I'll tell you. Don't don't tell me about it. Well, there's a great story around (laughs) it. So, uh, this is why I'm going to tell you this one, Um, and also a trout, by the way. So, uh, I had a brown trout hit a spro rat. Um, So, so for those who don't know, what's a spro rat? Spro makes a. uh, It's a. They have three different sizes: a thirty, forty, and a fifty. It's a an actual rat literally it's a swim bait called the spro rat and you can look it up online and you'll see it literally looks like a mouse it's got a tail it's got you know 
whiskers on it, ears, the whole nine yards. Um, and it's a, it's a, really, it's a swim bait, but it's a wake bait. So it walks across the top. You can crank it down a little bit and get that sometimes to dive, you know, mm-hmm. a couple inches or a foot down. Um, and usually it's, it's used traditionally for largemouth bass. Um, so I was out one night, um, fishing and I had the guy that created the bait, Bill, Bill Simitel called me and uh, he says, Hey, what are you up to? And I said, we had a couple of things we had to talk about, but he says, what are you up to? I said, Hey, I'm out fishing right now. I'm, I'm just, I'm getting brown trout after brown trout. It's incredible. He says, yeah, what do you use it? And I told him, you know, I'm using a repeller and went through colors and stuff. And he says, yeah, I'll be impressed when you can get one on the rat. And I said, really? Is that a challenge? And he says, ah, you can take it as you want, but I'll be impressed if you can send me a picture uh, with one on the rat. It's okay. So I went back to my car, grabbed a Spro Rat 30, and uh, put it on my line. And I told, I told Bill, hey, I'll talk to you later. I get back to the pond, and, and not, not even kidding, 12 minutes later, I pull out a nice, you know, over two and a half pound brown trout on the Spro Rat. That's amazing. Called Bill up, and he goes, there's no way. And I said, yeah. And it actually got shared on his webpage, which is um, the bbz.com. Um, he shared the little quick story on his webpage and stuff. It was really cool. That's really cool. No, I have a Spro Rat. I, I didn't know it had a name. Because <laughs> someone gave it to me without a package. And ah. and throwing that thing's insane. I, I don't have heavyweight gear. Mm-hmm. But uh, in, in the one I have, is it's it's like seven inches long. It's a giant. And, uh, yeah, that would be fifty. Yeah. yeah, and they're way fun to throw, and and it's really fun. Is is I I throw at a lot of pickerel ponds, mm-hmm. and the pickerel have terrible aim. They're not good at eating things, and just to watch the fish slapping at it, trying to catch it as it comes across the water, it's just pure joy. So they're really yeah. cool. That's a good. That's a good story. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Uh, it's fun to catch fish on things that that they shouldn't be eating. I have a friend who catches trout um, using bass gear all the time. That's his go to. Yeah. That's cool. That's a good one. Yeah, it was very exciting. Wow, that's really good. Well, before we get into the meat of this stuff, uh, we got a we got another uh, review on iTunes. I always like to share our iTunes reviews, and one of the best ways that new fans find us is through iTunes. And so if you like our show, go to iTunes.com and leave us a review. And this was from Juan234. <laughs> uh, he gives a five-star review. That's the only right review to give us. Uh, in fact, if you're going to give us less than that, just don't bother. Um, he says, I listen to this every time I'm at work. Can't get enough of fish in the news or random stories you guys tell. Keep up the good job. Much love from Texas. So we're getting some love from from Texas. That's pretty cool. I was just in Texas. What were you doing in Texas? I was doing some work stuff down there. Uh, I was in western Texas near uh, Mid- Midland, Odessa area. Yep. And I tried looking for water, and there's there's no water it's up like there. like a desert. <laughs> oh, God. There was... A, yeah, you know, I, I really did. Like before I went, I'm like, I'm gonna find some cool stuff to do while I'm out there. I was up there for five days. I'm gonna try to find a lake to fish. I'm gonna try to find something cool to do, and I couldn't find a lake to fish because it's just a desert. But I did find something cool to do. Um, What'd you do? Yeah, uh, I didn't do it. I oh. found something cool <laughs> well, to do, have, but I <laughs> <laughs> I found something really cool to do, um, but I didn't have time to do it. Unfortunately, well, ended up working about. Five twenty-hour days. Uh, it's called the Carlsbad Caverns oh, I've heard in of these. Carlsbad, New Mexico. Oh, it's beautiful. You take like an elevator under the earth and go into these giant, massive caverns. Um, it was about two hours west of where I was in uh, in Midland, but I didn't get to go. I had to work too much. Uh, don't you don't you wish when you're away traveling for work they would give you like three extra days and some extra money to go and play while you're there, just just so you can enjoy the space? They surely they totally should. Yeah. I mean, but. Yeah, I, I was really looking forward to it, and that was like my my only plan. It was like, all right, if everything goes good, you know, I'm I'm gonna go over here and spend a couple hours. It was a two hour ride, of course, so I had to take at least a half a day to do so. But um, I was really really looking forward to it because it's, it's absolutely beautiful. But uh, yeah, it, well, work happens. It's real life. <laughs> yeah. we, we can't all uh, we can't all just have tons of money and travel for free. So someday, <laughs> <laughs> someday, someday, yeah. All right. So, hey, Phil, the reason you're here, though, is not because you like to fish and talk about fishing. That's just part of it. But um, you're actually uh, you're famous. And I just want to tell everyone, we knew you before you were cool. Uh, so <laughs> people who think that we're fair weather friends, we've been, we've been fishing together for a couple of years and chatting online for a bunch of time. Uh, but you are going to be on TV. And you called me yesterday and said, Clay... I got to get on your show this week because Monday I'm going to be on TV and I want everyone to know. And on Monday is the day this show is released. So today you're going to be on TV. You want to tell us about that? 
Famous yeah. <laughs> Not famous. Yeah, uh, that you're the big time. Saying, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Saying that you you knew me before I was cool is is uh yeah. is cool as in the eyes of the beholder. I knew you. I, <laughs> I knew you when you were just a nerd. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So, yeah, first I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about yesterday. You know, I get an email from uh from one of the, the the PR people over at Fishing University and says, "Hey, you know, great news. We uh, we moved your your TV show up." Um, and more great news, you know, we picked up an, another channel because before they were they were just being broadcasted for six months or first two quarters of the year on uh, the outdoor channel. Mm-hmm. So the way and these just, work is the production company makes the show and then and sells it to other networks. Is that the model? Um, from from my understanding, yeah. I mean, the Fishing University has been on. This is the thirty first season. Wow. It's been on TV. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's been around for a while. The host, you know. Uh, Ray Brazier and Charlie Ingram have been doing this stuff for a long time, but so yeah, get the email and it says, "Hey, great, we're going to be on another TV uh, network. We're also going to uh, we've got the the dates for the show, and uh, your first airing is January second, which is today, of course. But that was I was just told that on Friday, so I had three days. So I was like, oh man, I was expecting you know mid January." Uh, late January, and I'm mean, extremely excited about it. Um, but it was just like, wow, that, that's you know, doesn't give me a whole lot of time. So I no, I mean, it's funny because you called me a couple of months ago and were telling me about this, and you were saying, oh, don't worry, we'll have plenty of time to promote it when it's ready. Yeah. And then it's like, now we're going to hurry and do it. So, so it's, yeah. it's Fishing University. So that's yep. at fishing you. That's just the letter u dot com. www dot fishing letter u dot com. And yep. that's where they can get all the dates. So I, I know I don't have cable. I can't afford uh, on my fish nerd salary. I can't afford the cable that allows me channels like the Outdoor Network and <laughs> Sportsman Television and all this stuff. Um, what is Fishing You? I've never actually heard of it until you called me. Okay. So, uh, Fishing You, it's been on the Outdoor Channel, but it's been um, kind of all over the place. So Fishing University is they take fishing on the road. They usually visit a school and stuff like that. But during the actual show... Um, we go out and fish. So um, I got the opportunity to go on the show and fish with Ray and Charlie, who are the hosts of the show, um, against a, a special guest that they had, which was uh, Bill Semitel, the creator of the, the Spro BBZ mm-hmm. lure. Um, we got to fish against Bill with his own lure. The only lure that we were allowed to use was that Spro Rat that I we talked about earlier, um, right. the Spro Rat 30, 40, and 50. So essentially, we get up there and we went up to upstate New York, Saratoga Lake, and we did some fishing up there. We had an excellent time. But it's Ray and I in one boat, and the other boat is Charlie and Bill, and it's the best of five fish. So whoever gets the the heaviest bag after after the day you know, wins the show. But so it's, um, a, it's a competition. It, it is, and then it's also uh, after the competition's kind of done, we wrap up. We we go to we actually went and visited a local school and and did a. Uh, speaking seminar there and, and talked a little bit about what you know encouraging people to get outdoors and, and pursue a career in the outdoors um so yeah you know they do 13 13 episodes a year i believe um each show is played six times which now i think is is doubled um because i know in the email i got she said it's gonna play an extra 20 times this year on the sportsman channel so that, that's yeah. That's so exciting. I mean, you must be psyched to see how they edit it up and how how you come out on it. I mean, it's you know for <laughs> people like me and uh, I, I have such a huge ego. I, I I always get excited to see my own my own mug on things. But um, what? How did you get on TV? Like, like those of us like like I watch you do stuff, and I'm I'm always impressed with with who you connect with, and to see you get on TV, and I'm like, man, I want to do that. How does one do that kind of thing? Someone wants to be a ah. professional angler. So remember how you were saying money. you were saying earlier you go for brook trout and you yeah. dangle that thing in front of the <laughs> yeah. uh, and it's a lot of luck. Uh, it, it, re- it really is. You know, I, I do work hard and and I do um, I do pride myself in, in my networking skills and, and meeting with people and I kind of um, I guess I got lucky. You know, I I talked to the right people and I kept fishing the right products that that someone was apparently paying attention to and I had some of my pro staff companies and sponsors that were, were sharing my stuff and it fell into the right hands and they said, yeah, we'll take that guy. Um, so you didn't, actually, you didn't go to them. They came to you or both. Yeah, you, it was kind of a yeah, both. 
they, they came to me. You want to hear a really cool story about it? Yeah, that's what we want to hear. Yes. Cool yeah. Story. All right. Cool story. So I got a call one day from a guy. Um, I can't give out too much information, but yeah. How about his number? I get, yeah, I get a call from a guy and he says, <laughs> "Hey, you're, you know, we're looking for a guy that throws swim baits up in New England. Um, we're looking for someone that's going to be, you know, have the ability to talk on TV and be great and represent some of these outdoor outdoorsmen, but also going to be great in front of a camera." And uh, your name came up. I said, oh, that's great. You know, what's the show? What's what? You know, what's the deal? He says, oh, it's Fishing U- University, uh, which I had heard of because I'm a, a geek. But I said, yeah, that, that's great. I, uh, you know, give me the give me the details. He said, well, I'll, I'll get back to you. I'm going to have someone else give you a call. And uh, I got a call from the VP of marketing at Spro. He says, hey, I talked to so and so, and he gave me your number, and we wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, doing a TV show up in Saratoga Lake. We went over the details of the show and stuff, um, and they actually. They, Spro is the sponsor of, of the show that you'll see today on Fishing University. Um, they paid for my family and I to travel to upstate New York. My wife and kids came with me, which you, was you're great. Seventeen kids. <laughs> um, three kid, three kids right now. Four in about two months. Yeah, and but then <laughs> fishing is over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, um, after a few phone calls back and forth, we had talked about some of the details where we were going. You know, dates, things like that. Uh, I had another call from the original guy that called me and said, hey, so I talked to these guys again. We want to make sure you're 100% in. And uh, I said, yeah, you yeah, a great opportunity for me. And I'm absolutely flattered and honored to uh, even be considered by you guys. And he says, good, because you're the only person we even called. Perfect. Uh, which for me really blew my mind because I'm, I'm not a professional fisherman. Um, I, I don't do charters. I'm not a guide. I'm just a guy that works a nine-to-five job who loves to fish after hours. Um, and I do what I can and get out as much as I can, but that's it. I just love fishing. And I got a TV show and Spro, which is a, a huge company, um, called me and asked me to, to do this. There's millions of people in the U.S. that fish like I do, and somehow the, the pin fell on my head and, uh, and I got invited, which is super exciting and really just a kind of a mind-blowing, mind-blowing experience. I mean, it's, it's exciting. It's really cool, and it's a nice compliment to to you as a fisherman that they noticed you. I mean, what you, one of the things you do right is when you catch a fish on someone's product, you share that fish and the photos with them, and you make a big deal about it. And that's what people get excited about. It's all about stroking those egos and getting oh, them, showing yeah. them, hey, look, your bait works for me. And, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's funny. As someone who's not sponsored by anybody, um, I'm always interested in seeing how this works because I haven't, I haven't figured all this out yet, and it's not my, my brain doesn't lock in that same way that that's, that pro anglers' brains lock in. <laughs> and I keep waiting for someone to walk through my door and say, "Hey, I'm going to give you a whole bunch of money and take you fishing," and that's not going to happen because you have to be proactive and and, and go get it. Um, so you were on TV. You got to film this thing. Tell me about. So you're you're on two different bass boats. Yeah, so there's two and, different bass boats. And then there's chase are, boats with cameras, right? Correct. Yep. And how's that impact the fishing? Um, honestly, it didn't. You know, we, we kind of went up there with the game. We, Charlie and I, uh, I'm sorry, Ray and I kind of had a game plan when we got on the water um, after halftime. Uh, at first, it was kind of we were figuring out the lakes. We were just driving around. We had the chase boat, boats, and we had, uh, also had a cameraman on our boat. We tried a few different spots, and then about halftime, we went up. You know, we kind of revealed our scores. We, we were at for poundage or weight by halftime and said, you know, let's go finish up the day and, and what do we want to do? And I said, you know, I think we figured it out. Let's go hit the docks. So it wasn't too bad. Um, you know, him in the front of the boat, me in the middle of the boat, camera guy in the back of the boat, chase boat behind us. And, and we're just fishing dock lines as we go down. Um, so it, it wasn't too bad. I, it was still kind of, you know, surreal. You know, you did have to watch out when you're casting and stuff, throwing, you know, these rat 30, 40s, or 50s that you're not hooking somebody like a camera guy. But uh, I was watching a YouTube video of a kid getting hooked in the neck with, with one of those rats. You know, his mom Oof. hooked it. Yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> you have to share that with me. <laughs> Let's see if I can find it. He's <laughs> um, not going to get sponsored. It's not sure. <laughs> Maybe I'll send her a rat, though. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah. I. Other than, you know, knowing that there's a camera guy that's behind you that's going to at some point put what you're doing at the very moment on TV, um, it's a, a little nerve-wracking at first. It took a little, a little while to get used to, but as far as affecting the fishing, I don't think it had any impact. 
Well, that's good. I, I would be concerned. I would be distracted. Now, I, I have a trouble with cameras. And I, I was on a play, in a play recently, and it's not just cameras. It's whenever I know people are watching me, I smile. Like, I just, I can't help it. Like, it's an yep. instinctive thing you get when you're a kid. It's so like, I was in a play recently, and I'm, I was playing the Reverend, um, which is a relatively serious role. <laughs> and I walk on stage, and the entire time, I'm a terrible actor, by the way. Don't, never, no one should ever hire me to act. Um, but I walk on stage, and the whole time I'm delivering my lines, I am fighting the urge to just have a giant smile on my face. <laughs> Uh, and, and I think if I was on a TV show, I'd be doing the same thing. I'd be looking at the camera and mugging at it and smiling and wrecking the whole show. So, um, uh, I tried so hard. <laughs> I tried so hard because you, you, you know, they tell you you kind of want to ignore the camera. You don't want to make it look like everything's set up and uh-huh. fake. You just ignore it, pretend it's not there. Right. But doesn't and, ignoring it also is that a natural feeling too? Like it is. It is. is. Someone's not next to you. <laughs> Right, yeah. ignoring the you know, ignoring the elephant in the room kind of thing. Yeah, it's like it's like all right, I'm trying, I'm trying, and then every once in a while, like I would, I'd, I'd get in a comfortable spot where I'm I'm just fishing, I'm just doing my thing and, and fishing. And then I'd look over and see a camera guy. Oh shit, you know <laughs> he's, what did I do? Did you really get embarrassed in the last two or three minutes? <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna start picking your nose. Yeah, that was really itchy. I, I would I would just talk to the camera guy the whole time. I just break you know, that fourth wall all day. <laughs> we, I will say that um, our camera guy, his name is Rick Cheatham, um, was unbelievable, awesome, awesome guy, man. He was just all day long, so helpful. Um, we went out to dinner the night before uh, and the day that we went fishing. Just in, incredible guy, and he really he helped calm my nerves when we first got out there with the, you know, don't worry about this. We're gonna put this here, and I'm gonna be over here. This will, you know, and really like gave me the inside of. This is how this shot's going to look. You know, don't worry about what your face looks like or this or that. He really walked through a lot with us. Um, and Rick was just, he's an absolutely great guy. Mm-hmm. And how was, um, how was the um, makeup and all that? Did they do a good job with makeup? And... <laughs> my, wife, my wife took care of my makeup for me. Excellent, excellent. Well, someone, <laughs> someone has to do it. Okay, so this is going to be airing all the time. Uh, but people can get the whole schedule at, at fishingyou.com, is that correct? Yeah, the first, um, you know, for January 2nd, just the use of the day, this comes out. It'll be on twice. Um, it'll be in the outdoor channel at 7.30 a.m., and then it will be on my sportsman channel at 11 a.m. And then it doesn't come on again on Thursday. Mm-hmm. Thursday, it will be on the sportsman channel at 10 a.m., and then Friday, it'll be on the outdoor channel at 7.30 a.m., and then on Saturday, it's on the outdoor channel at 5 a.m. and 1.30 p.m. Okay. So that's, yeah, that's a, a couple of times. A couple of times. And, and if people go to Fishing You, can they find it there and, and link back to what? Because they're going to, you know, people listening to the show aren't going <laughs> to not make a note yeah. of driving. Yep. So if you go to fishingyou.com and then there's a, a link up top, uh, I'm sorry, a tab up top called Show Schedule, um, it'll be on there, I believe. I'm there right now. And <laughs> it's called Fishing You, right? Correct. Oh, this is the 2016 schedule. <laughs> yeah, I, I would imagine. I know they they just got the schedule, so I'm hoping maybe this will be up by Monday. Well, we'll get it figured out. But we'll yeah. get back to it. And if you send me that list of, of the schedule you just gave, I will put it on the show notes at fishners.com and link to fishing you as well, so people can click right through to it and uh, and make sure they get a chance. To see it. And Phil, is it ever going to be streaming online or is that not a thing? Yeah, it will be, um, I guess, after it airs on the two, the Outdoor Channel and Sportsman Channel and World Fishing Network. And we'll be sure once it gets to that point, you share it with me. I'll share it out with the Fish Nerd Nation and make sure everyone who uh, is like me and can't afford the good cable can also see it. Oh, there's a schedule. Great. Um, so, and again, the schedule will be at uh, fishnerds.com in the show notes for this episode. Um, and it'll be easy to find. And Phil, I'm so proud of you. Like, it's so fun to watch people be successful. I have a few friends like you who have, who have kind of really, in the last couple of years, gotten some kind of, some kind of cool success. And I really love watching, uh, that transition and, and to see where people, what happens next and what is happening next. So, Phil, what's the next big thing besides your baby? What's happening next? Right now, that's the focus. The we, baby. we don't care about the baby. <laughs> <laughs> the babies are gross. <laughs> as, as far as uh, as far as fishing, the next big thing, I'm not really sure yet. We'll see what 2017 brings. I do have you know quite a few plans for the year. 
um, I, I possibly designed a lure for a, a bait company um, that may be coming out in 2017. Sweet. Yeah. Sweet. Got some other cool stuff. I'll share when I can. That's some cool. cool stuff coming out. That's really cool. I'm going to have to off the uh, off off the recording. I have to bend your ear sometime about how to how to get sponsored and all that because I, I don't understand that one bit. So uh, it's could, it's a lot of fucking work. Yeah, but I could use the advice on just give me a direction to head because right now I'm just doing my thing and I've been kind of plugging away and I'm like oh, I've got to do something different. So I don't mind working. Yeah. Everything I'll tell you the number one thing that people get confused about the pro staff thing or a sponsorship mm-hmm. is that they don't give a shit how big your fish is. They just want quality photos and mm-hmm. happy fish. Mm-hmm. So as long as you're consistently getting pictures of fish and they're very good lighting, you've got good lighting on your face, the, the fish is turned the right way. And you can see the bait. You can see the bait clearly. Um, I'm po- I have one of my companies that I'm, I'm actually getting paid for to pro staff for, which is incredible. Um, that they, they want three pictures of every fish that I catch. They want wow. a picture of, the, of the, the bait in the mouth. They want a picture of me and the fish. And then they want a third picture of the actual hook inside the fish's mouth. Yeah, they love that. So, yeah. So they want three different pictures usually or two, usually minimum of two. But they want two or three different pictures of the fish. And they'll compile it later on and, and make a good, you know, a good photo op or, or a mm-hmm. Facebook page mm-hmm. post. Sorry, Facebook post from it. But quality of pictures is absolutely king. Yeah, and, that, and, that, and and that's harder than people think. Fish pictures are hard to take, so that's interesting. We could do a whole show on just that. It's interesting that we could yeah. that best uh, brook trout I caught last year, this year, uh, uh, last year, I guess, um, the uh, the pictures of the bait in his mouth are perfect, and it's a no-name brand, off-market <laughs> tungsten jig that I got for 25 cents on clearance at Walmart. Twenty-five cents is a good deal for a tungsten jig, oh, though. I, I got a ton of them. I got them last spring at the closeout, so they were all uh, marked way down as giant pile of them, and I just bought like you know, twenty-five bucks worth. <laughs> so the fish nerds this year, Phil, we're going to be at the uh, New England Fishing and Outdoor Expo at the end of the month in January here. Guess and what? I'll see you there all three days. I'll be there for three days. So far, it's, be, it's me by myself in a booth for three days, which is going to be a long three days. That's the 27th, 28th, and 29th. Go Fish Dan puts this show on every year. Uh, and this year, there's some big names in fishing going to be there. Uh, Captain Sean Tibbetts will be there, who's a friend of mine. I like seeing him around. Um, you're going to be there, right? Yeah, I'll be there all three days. Yep, uh, I'll be working the uh, the hog tank again this year. Hog tank, cool. Um, I'm going to be there, and let's see. I think um, Mike Iaconelli is going to be there. I'm going to try and grab him for the show. Is he going to be there this year? He is. He's going at, at the uh, the Bass University. Oh, that's right. Yes. Yeah. Yep. His pictures on the website. The website is New England or NEFishingExpo dot com. So, and Phil, you're going to be there, and you have some big news you want to share. Yeah. So. I it's not giant news for the huge, show, but uh, huge, huge. It, it's it's really cool the um, that news. I'm on TV in the beginning of January, the end of January. You know, we got this awesome show in New England. Dan Kenny puts on every year, um, and I will be there, and um, I will be there representing a, a new rod. Um, so I, I had spent this year uh, with a company, a rod company, Tsunami Rods, who's mainly a freshwater company, looking at how we can make a swim bait rod, a rod that's specifically designed for swim baits. Um, and I tested eight or nine different models and different blanks t- to find kind of the perfect composition for a swim bait rod, which is in general, if you don't know what a swim bait is, they're much heavier. You know, like that Spro 50 rat that you have, you know, they've got a couple ounces on them. So you need a, a rod that's got a big one on it. You can it's throw like, those it's bigger like baits. It's like throwing your kids toys. You know, like a tongue yeah, <laughs> exactly. So I spent this year coming up with this rod and um, after couple of tweaks and, and going through all these different rods. We're actually pushing the rod for the first time uh, this year as a swim bait rod. Um, kind of get my, my face on the forefront of it, which is great. Um, and also Spro is, is also chipping in some uh, some door prizes and stuff like that. Give me some tank time. So you will see me if you're there. I'll be there for the three days. I will be up at the, the, uh, the hog tank throwing a the new Tsunami swim bait rod as well as a uh, some Spro products and Spro rats, swim baits, etc. Well, cool. Well, I hope to see you there, and you can. I'm going to be recording live shows at the Fish Nerds table, and so you can swing by and spend five minutes in the mic with me. I'm going to try to do like a bunch of five minute quick story bits. So yeah, I mean, there's going to be a lot of great, great guys there, and, and some of the bigger companies. You know, Daddy Mac Lures are going to be there, and the biggest. Um, 
the, the biggest New England company. <laughs> De- I love Jack and, and Dennis. The, yeah, the whole company is great. Been so good to us, yeah. Yeah, and, and you get Mass Bass Boys and Radfish Lures. There's just so many companies that will be there. It'll be a great time. I was playing mini golf this summer, and uh, one of those mad those uh, Mass Bass Boys was in front of me on a sweatshirt, had, and uh, I just met them for the first time playing mini golf in North Conway, New Hampshire. So. No kidding. Yeah, these guys, Do you know who it was? I no, I don't remember. I didn't, didn't connect with him on Facebook or anything. So just, uh, okay. I just briefly, t- I was playing golf with my kids, and my kids lose patience in my fish nerds stuff. So I did not it, take it, their time. <laughs> they, they've got a great following on social media, and they're, really, they're a great group of guys. And uh, yeah. I'll have to, I'll bring Jason, who's the, the owner, the creator of the Mass Bass Boys, over at the show, and maybe you can do a five minute info with him. He's a great guy. Uh, sounds good. Anyway, so for more information, go to nefishingexpo.com and that's the end of January 27, 28, 29. And uh, we're going to be there and you should be there too. It'll be to- tons of fun and you'll get, you know, for 10 bucks, you get a whole day of entertainment. Easy. That's a good deal. Yeah. And there will be uh, line cutters is going to be there too. And I know you've done Vance a few times in the show recently. Vance uh, is my new best friend apparently. Yeah, Dan, he's the man. He's all, I've been with him for uh, uh, well over a year now. I'm probably closer to two years now on his pro staff team, and he is an incredible guy. He works hard, and so yeah, I'm, I'm excited to meet him. Um, he's fresh out of Shark Tank with a big win there, and it'd be great. So, New England fishing, uh, nefishingexpo.com. <laughs> be there, or um, you know, or go fishing. I guess I don't know, but be there. <laughs> We're gonna be there, so you should too. All right. We have a new segment on the show, brand new, called Guide's Corner. Uh, Michael Frank from Columbia, South Carolina, is our new guide correspondent. Michael Frank runs franksflyarts.com. And you can find more information from him at that website I just mentioned. Uh, and you can hire him if you're traveling to South Carolina. But here's his new segment. Hello and welcome to the Fish Nerds Podcast's new segment, Guides Corner. I'm Michael Frank, owner and lead guide at Frank's Fly Arts Fly Fishing Guide Service here in Columbia, South Carolina. I thought I'd start out this segment of the podcast with a short shout out to all of the women who fly fish. I started my guide service with the intention of exposing people to a trout fishery that had been here for 35 years, as well as to the landlocked striped bass population that makes the Saluda, Congaree, and Broad Rivers its home here in Columbia. Along the way, I wanted to educate people about environmental factors that were affecting fish habitat and just introduce people to my favorite pastime of fly fishing, a hobby that I feel many would have never otherwise considered getting involved in. The humble beginnings of Frank's Fly Arts go back to an idea I had to hold fly tying classes at a local craft store. I walked into an AC Moore Arts and Crafts and asked to speak to the manager. I explained to her what I wanted to do, and she looked at me with the slightly skeptical and presumptive look I've become accustomed to when bringing flashy yarns and materials like feather boas to the cash register at one of these establishments here in the Deep South. It's one of probing inquisitiveness that seeks to answer the unspoken question of where I fall on the sexual preference spectrum. I explained to the manager that I was a fly tire, and I told her that I had been coming to her store to cull materials that I thought would be useful in creating artificial fishing flies for months, and that I would now like to offer a weekly fly tying class in their workshop area. This was met with much opposition. I don't think men would come here for a class. I don't think women would do this. Women around here don't fish. But I was ready for her. I told her that this was an opportunity. Many times I'd seen other guys wandering around the store like zombies, their eyes glazed over looking for a bench to sit on and wait for their wives or girlfriends to finish shopping. What if, what if these men were fly fishermen? What if I introduced them to fly tying and gave them a guide to all of the useful materials they could buy at her craft store for tying flies? She could turn these zombies into eager participants in the craft store shopping trip, who would also be paying customers. Now this piqued her curiosity, and she sent me home with the assignment of writing up a curriculum and materials list. The classes themselves were a modest success. A father and son signed up for a four-session class, and I think I had one other student. Of course, this was way better than the manager ever imagined I would have done. The most entertaining and educational part of this little experiment, however, happened in the weeks leading up to the class. 
Two Saturdays in a row, I set up a folding table right in the front of the store where I tied flies and handed out business cards hoping to sign people up for my class. Many of the women who walked by just assumed I was making jewelry, but many more stopped to watch and to talk to me, and that was when the dam would burst. When these women stopped, they told me stories about a grandfather who had always fly fished and told me they wished he had taken the time to teach them to do it. Stories about trips out west to fly fish big western rivers with their husbands. Or just stories about their trips to the lake house or the beach where they fished with rubber worms or cut bait. Two of the ladies who stopped to talk to me hung around for over an hour watching me tie. When they first stepped up to the table, they said it looked like fun making the flies and that all the flies I'd made would look great as earrings. Just before they left, I told them the classes started in about a week and to let me know if they wanted to sign up to learn how to make flies for earrings. The one lady answered, You think we'd want to use these for earrings? Hell no! If I learned to tie these, I'd want to catch fish on them. So what does this have to do with guiding? When you first start out guiding, you have to establish a client base. In some cases, like mine, where the local trout fishery was an open secret enjoyed mainly by older men, you have to establish an actual market. First, you should know that many of your clients may come from non-fishing backgrounds and be ready to promote to this market in unique ways. Be ready to spend time getting out to meet potential clients and patiently teaching about your pastime, even before you're on the water with a client. Second, as we heard in the podcast about guiding mishaps, being a successful fishing guide generally comes down to customer service. Understanding the needs of your clients goes a long way to helping you provide the excellent customer service that leads to those repeat bookings we all hope for. In future shows, I plan to interview some of my female clients and a friend and neighbor who I've fished with for about a year now to try to provide any of you who are thinking about guiding with insights into what fisherwomen want from a guided trip. This show is funded entirely by our fans over at Patreon. Patreon is a crowdfunding site like Kickstarter where you can fund ongoing art projects. And make no mistake, a podcast is an art project. I spend hours editing, creating, and making this show entertaining for you. So if you like it, I'm asking all listeners to give $1 per episode, $4 a month, to keep this show going. And we, uh, believe it or not, we are on life support right now. We have been losing money every month, and it costs us well over $300 a month to make the show. And right now we make about 175 on Patreon. It's our only funding source currently. So if you want to keep the show going, go to patreon.com forward slash fish nerds and give us a freaking dollar. Phil, you give us money, right? Of course I do. Why do you give us money? Uh, because you told me to. <laughs> See, there it is. <laughs> no, you guys are great. I love, I love the show that you put on. I look forward to every podcast when it comes out. I'm trying to find the time to listen to it. I, I enjoy it. It's great. It's entertainment. I mean, for what... I've paid a lot more money to do a lot sillier things in less time. You guys give us a, usually a, a great show, you know, exceeding a half hour that's entertaining, well worth a couple of bucks a month. Yeah, easy money. And, and again, if you give a small amount, it doesn't hurt your bank account. But if a lot of people do it, it really helps us. And again, we're on life support. Um, so if you want the show to go, you have to support the show. And I'm not doing this to be like, you know... <laughs> To be funny, we, we need the show to keep going. I love making it, but I just can't afford to keep paying for it. So, you know, help us out. Give us a dollar. <laughs> it's not a big deal. Fishnerds.com for more information on that or just reach out on Facebook to us. And I guarantee you the Fish Nerds podcast is the most interactive of all shows. If you reach out to us, we always talk to everybody. And so we're here. It's your show. Keep it going. There's that. And now it's time for Fish in the News. Do you like Fish in the News, Phil? Of course I do. Everyone loves Fish in the News. <laughs> uh, first, I have a quick segment from Captain Sean Tibbetts at MainTunaFishing.com. He occasionally sends us these little little bits, and eventually we're going to ease him into a new segment called uh, Fishing Vets in the News, where he's focused on, on uh, vets who have made the news in the fishing world. Uh, but here's a quick story from Cat Michonne about a brown trout. By the way, Phil, my whole life, I didn't think brown trout was a real fish. Really? <laughs> yeah. I was raised where brown trout was like, when your goldfish died, your dad would put it in the toilet and flush it and go, oh, 
He's swimming with a brown trout, and I thought brown <laughs> trout was only a euphemism for poop. I had no idea. So, it actually wasn't until uh, about, beautiful. about 10 years ago I learned the truth. <laughs> so, and now whenever I catch one, I just think, oh, shit. <laughs> so, I see what you did there. You I like see it. What I, um, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so here's, here's Captain Sean. All right, fish nerds, Captain Sean here. This story comes to us from KTAR News. Uh, Southern Arizona River rebounding with more fish and less smell. Hmm, I wonder why. More fish are calling a river near Tuscan home thanks to upgrades at a near, nearby wastewater treatment facilities. These water reclamation plants provide the water that flows into the lower Santa Cruz River. Back in 2013, water quality wasn't so great. There were a lot of brown trout lily pads. There weren't as many fish and a strong odor emanated from the facilities. Since then, Pima County has invested $600 million to upgrade those wastewater treatment facilities. We've been finding that the water clarity and quality is much improved. There's a whole lot less brown trout, said Claire Zugmeyer, an ecologist with the Soren Institute who has been tracking the changing river. We have a new species of fish that are living in the river. A new report released by the Soren Institute in Pima County reflects the changes in the river between October 2014 and September 2015. Zugmeyer said, at first they could only find mosquito fish. Now they're finding common carp, green sunfish, and black bullhead. In addition, the rotten egg smell that once enveloped the area has now been significantly reduced. To see clear water and be able to see fish and turtles in the water, it's a treat, and a lot of people don't get to do that regularly. Well, now remember, this is Arizona. They don't have a lot of water. Zugmeyer said these recent changes have made the river healthier. It's also helped Pima County water supply. The water does not flow as far downstream because most of it is seeping into the county aquifers where it is stored as groundwater. Mmm, I wonder how well that groundwater was before they fixed the sewage treatment plants. All right, and uh, uh, Fish Nerds has a uh, podcasting group. Uh, if you listen to the show and you want to get really involved, uh, we have the Facebook page, which has 14,000 people on it, but we have our group, which has about 500 dedicated fans, uh, and that's where the real action is. Facebook suppresses business pages, so we had to create a group to really have good conversations. Jeff Danielson shared two Fish in the News stories with us this week, and Phil and I are going to run them down for you today. And the first one's called Fish in Space. Uh, and this is from Scientific American. And it's the first fish in orbit. The late John Glenn was the first American in orbit. And that Russian pooch Leica was the first dog. But it's now time to acknowledge another species. Have you seen a story before? Uh, not until you sent it to me today. Ah, this is, uh, now, this is a story that Dave and I reported on in 2011 before we were podcasting. Actually, the story is about this one. And because it, it was on our, we were on a quest to catch and eat every kind of freshwater fish in the state, and this was one of our fishes. So, so it says, when you launch a human body into space, sometimes that body becomes sick with nausea uh, and general dis- disorientation for the first few days. After a time, that body is better. This is the space version of seasickness. Because gravity holds our four feet on the sorry <laughs> holds our feet on the ground, we humans basically move in two dimensions on Earth. So it may not be surprising that when you launch our bodies into gravity-free three-dimensional movement in space, that our stomachs lurch and our heads spin. In the 1970s, National Association of Space, right about NASA, uh, wondered how zero gravity would affect fish, animals that moved in three dimensions on Earth. Does a fish get space sick? For this important aquatic mission, NASA needed a fish that required little care but could endure the stress of space launch and time in space. NASA's first considered the goldfish, but they were not tough enough. NASA instead chose a drab, humble minnow found in salt marshes called the mummichog. Do you know this fish? I do, yes. Yeah, it's a great little fish. Good bait, right? Phenomenal bait. That's why I know it. (laughs) Yeah, and if you ever waded the bays of Fundy, Can, or Chesapeake Bay, Gulf of Mexico, in the U.S., and saw schools of minnows darting between your legs, then you've met the first fish in space. Uh, Now, Dave and I uh, ate this little fish, Phil. Did you know? You probably know that story. I Uh, followed them, yeah. Yeah, and we made uh, what's called chognog. So we we mulled the mummy chog in uh, cider spices, and then we put it on 
it was around Christmas time we caught it, <laughs> and we put it on, um, uh, uh, what's that? Oh, nog, eggnog, and then eggnog, poured yeah. rum in it and drank it on live television. Uh, and it was a terrible thing. Don't ever do that. <laughs> I'll take your word yeah, for I'll it. Yeah, I'll put a link to fishnerds.com if you want to watch that video. But we did this story before Scientific America. I'm just saying that fish nerds are in the game here. Uh, when two juvenile fish arrived at Skylab, they swam in, in elongated loops as though they were spitting hands a Salvador Dali created clock. Without gravity, the fish didn't know which way was up. On the third day, the fish swam in regular patterns, always with their backs toward the interior lights of the Skylab. In many animals, including two-legged kinds that build rockets, gravity tugs on special cells in the inner cells and tells the animal which way is up. That's from gravity. This is, the, this is called vestibular righteous purpose. Without gravity to tug on the inner ears, the mummy chogs relied on the artificial light to tell them to which direction was up. Using fish logic, this is reasonable. The sun never shines from the bottom of the ocean. So that's what they basically what they've learned from these fish. Now, mummy chogs are really cool. They, they can live in water temperatures upwards of 80 degrees. And they, can, and they can bury down the mud, and they can kind of like do a semi-hibernation and hide from dry weather. And they are super hardy. And that's why they chose these, uh, these fish to go to space. Um, resilient. Which is what? They're resilient. Oh, they're so tough, yeah. Why they make great bait too? Yeah, and they make really good bait. They stay on the hook for a long, long time, and they're really cool. Um, but yeah, that's Scientific American. They're about thirty years late on this story, but it's still a good story. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is. But again, if you share stories with us on Facebook, we'll try to use them in in the show. Uh, next one: What happens when your little cousins name a new species, the ninja shark? This is I get another one from a fan, and it is on. ScienceAlert.com. Scientists just discovered a weird new shark that glows in the dark. That's awesome. Say hello to the Ninja Lantern Shark, a species of shark that has only just been discovered. It's really weird. It hides in the deep, and its black skin keeps it camouflaged, but also glows in the dark. The Ninja Lantern Shark was discovered by a team of Pacific Shark Research by the Pacific Shark Research Center in Moss Landing, California. Its official name is Eptometrus Bencelli, after Jaws author Peter Bencelli. Oh, that makes sense, Bencelli. Uh, you know, it's funny. I try too hard to read Latin, and then I read it so badly because I'm over, overthinking it. But its <laughs> common name was coined by cousins of researchers Vicky Vasquez. The four of them, aged 8 to 14, suggested Super Ninja Shark, but she spelled <laughs> it back. I love it. We should like kids name every fish. Oh, yeah. It would all be way more fun to catch. Absolutely. Yeah. You wouldn't have any creek chubs. <laughs> They'd have better names. You know? Just imagine. What would you get? Oh, I got a super ninja shark, man. It was it's huge. Like, fast, God. man. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, the ninja lantern shark is roughly a half meter or 18 inches long, and it lives at the depth of 1,000 meters in the Pacific coasts of Central America. Its odd combo of dark and light helps it creep up on its prey. So... It's a really cool looking uh, fish. These fish from the deep water just are just so wacky looking. And then when they preserve them for photos, they never look like real things. Right. They just look bizarre. But we'll have photos up at fishnerds.com so you can see that fish. Uh, Phil, what's the weirdest fish you ever caught? Oh, I have no idea. You've never caught a weird fish? All that. I'm sure I have. I'm sure you have. Yeah, I'm I'm sure I I'm sure I've caught, I'm sure I've caught weird fish, but I may have caught them more than once. Now they're not weird anymore. That's how it is with me too. The first time is very odd. Like you know, like if you catch a big ocean sunfish or something, that would be, that would count as weird. But I'll I'm, tell you one of the, the weirdest experiences while catching a fish. All right, let's hear it. So I was fishing a pond down in, uh, in Plymouth, and uh, I was throwing a swim bait. I'm not sure which one it was, but walking it across the top, and I had a. Large my fast following, and I could see the wake coming behind the bait, so I knew it was there. So I slowed down, waited, and he hit it. And as soon as he hit it, I set the hook on it, and the fish is still up in the top of the water. So I'm trying to keep him out of the weeds and keep him up. And I see this giant osprey come down and grab the fish. And now I still have a hook in its mouth, and I I was able to uh, to get the fish out of its mouth, but he he left quite a quite a scar actually ripped the back of the fish kind of right off and took a big piece of the fin right off now it's always spooky and exciting when when birds come and take your fish and i always i'm always afraid of hooking them when they're doing it I, you know I, I don't mind them taking the fish but i don't want to hurt them at all yeah it, i'll tell you it was um 
completely unexpected because I didn't actually see the bird until he was like on top of the fish. So I'm so focused on, on watching, you know, looking for the shadow of where the fish is. Is he trying to go into brush or cover, trying to keep him up? Um, and all of a sudden, just this, you know, giant bird just comes down and, and smashes it. Um, it. It can be a little scary. Yeah, totally. it was. It, 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 yeah, totally spooked me. And, and it's like, holy cow! And, and like the, in the moment, like, what do I do? I've got a, a nice largemouth bass, and I've now got a bird that's trying to fly in the air with it. Yeah, well, that bird will fight a lot harder than that bass. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. If you caught the bird, you would get hurt a lot more than that bass. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, we never want to do that, but it happens. You know, it happens all the time. All right, so let's wrap this up, though. So that's it. You've listened to a couple of fish nerds when you could have been fishing. We'd like to thank our families for supporting us while we podcast and go on fishing quests and do all sorts of silly things that nerds do. If you would like to support the fish nerds, you can go to patreon.com and search for fish nerds and help us crowdfund this podcast. Uh, <laughs> special thanks to Michael Franks from FranksFlyArts.com, Captain Sean Tibbetts from MainTunaFishing.com, and of course, Phil Belcher Jr., uh, who's going to be a big time TV star. Whose uh, <laughs> show you can be found on fishingu.com. <laughs> and until next time, follow the code of the fish nerd. Spawn early and often. Avoid free lunches with strings attached. Swim against the current every chance you get. That's it. We're done. I want to say I want to say Frank's fly farts